Welcome to Gothenburg, a city that turns 400 years this year. Imagine that, 400. Where is that? Damascus, 5,000 years. Oh, um, nevertheless, since this is an anniversary year, we at the Sydney Museum of Gothenburg would like to give you a brief introduction to the birth of Gothenburg. And we'll do it in an exhibition that is called The Birth of Gothenburg. So please join us in a journey 400 years back in time. We are now standing in the exhibition. And here we have a map showing, of, showing what today is the Swedish West Coast. But 400 years ago, the boundaries went quite differently. The northern part here belonged to Norway, and the southern part here belonged to Denmark. And they were both ruled by the same king, the Danish king. And Sweden only had a small uh, minor corridor along the river Göta Elm to reach the sea without asking the Danish king for permission. Since the late Viking Age, there had been a small Swedish town here. Yeah. Earlier it was located a bit inland, but then moved closer to the coast. But this town was very hard to defend when the Danes attacked, and they did again and again, destroying the city. And sometimes the Swedes themselves destroyed the city just so the Danes couldn't. But finally, a Swedish king decided it was time for a new town, better defended, better located. It was time for Gothenburg. The king who made this decision was Gustavus Adolphus, one of Sweden's most famous war heroes. And that is because he dragged Sweden into the great European war called the Thirty Year War. He won a couple of battles, then got lost in the midst of the battlefield and was killed. To the Swedish self-image, he became the pure-hearted king who left his country to defend the Protestants against the evil Catholics. And just to make you understand how important he has been, in the 1950s, school children were asked, who would you like to be like? And the winner among boys was Gustavus Adolphus. To the city of Gothenburg, the connection with this king has been important at least since the, since the 1800s. In Gustavus Adolphus Square, you find a large statue of the king pointing towards the ground, saying, I found it. No, he's saying, this is where the city should be. There is a risk, though, that this is a bit of a one-way love, since the king founded at least a dozen cities and he visited Gothenburg once. But in Gothenburg, he was celebrated on the 6th of November. That is not his birthday, but his day of death. School children were practicing marching weeks in advance, and on that day they marched down to the square where some official person made a speech telling the children to be like Gustavus Adolphus. Be as brave, as pure-hearted, and as Swedish. Then the children had an afternoon off. It was a great day. Um, this continued at least until the 1960s. Today you'll find a couple of elderly men offering some flowers to the king on that day. And one thing more, a pastry. On the 6th of November in Gothenburg you can buy a pastry with a small portrait in chocolate of the king. So the decision was made to build a new town in the West. But what would it look like? Well, the Swedes wanted to follow the latest fashion. And the latest in Europe at this time when it came to towns, something called the ideal city. It was invented in Italy and was the combination of a city shaped like a circle or a star with straight streets leading to the center and equally large blocks. The city was surrounded by stone walls and was connected to the world through the streets. But this idea then came to the Netherlands and they made their own version of the ideal city. They didn't have as much stone, but they had a lot of mud. So the Dutch ideal city was one with earthworks, a moat and straight canals leading to the center. And the Swedish king said, I want one of those. So Gothenburg was planned uh, as a Dutch ideal city and uh, the project even invited a couple of Dutch engineers to take responsibility for the moat part and the canals. 
Today there is very little left of this old city. Uh, there are parts of the moat surrounding the old uh, part of the town. Uh, you can see a small part of the uh, walls that once surrounded the city and some of the canals is still here in the center of the city. But that's all. Gothenburg was a governmental project with an international touch. And this doubt with the rest of the world didn't stop there. The city got the city privileges written in two different languages, in Swedish and in German. That means Gothenburg got two names from the start. Göteborg in Swedish and in German Gothenburg, still used in English as Gothenburg. The government also wanted an international population, so they invited people, craftsmen, merchants from the Protestant part of Europe. Come and join us. Most of all, they hoped for well, wealthy trading houses from Amsterdam and Hamburg to establish. That didn't work out too well. But a lot of wind-driven souls showed up and they were welcome. If any Dutch tradesman with some status showed up, he was thrown into the city council. If you look at the names of the early city dwellers, you find German names, French names, Dutch names, British names. But the largest group was, of course, the people from the earlier city. Uh, and they were more or less forced to move. They had to leave their sites and rebuild their houses in the new town, and they were not pleased. They were not pleased with all the foreigners giving special treatments either. And finally, the king, the war hero, remember, he had to interfere, and he decided that there should be shared power in the town. There should be a city council, including 12 men with four Swedes, Three Germans, three Dutchmen, and two from Scotland. There should be three mayors, one Swede, one German, one Dutch, uh, sorry, Scotland. Uh, all important documents should be written in Swedish and Dutch, and the foreigners even got a church of their own, still known as the German Church. This situation remained for a couple of decades until the population had melted together and Gothenburg became more of a Swedish, Swedish town. So there it was, a brand new multilinguistic border town, ready for uh, defense and trading. And things also started to happening outside the city itself. Since the Middle Ages, Denmark had been the leading power in Scandinavia. But during the 1600s, the balance of power was shifting. Sweden became more and more a country organized for war. And for once, they uh, defeated Denmark again and again. And then Sweden started cutting pieces out of Denmark and Norway. From Norway, uh, we took Bohusland. And from Denmark, Halland. Uh, and the coastline became Swedish. And Gothenburg was no longer a threatened city. Instead, it became the center for administrating the new Swedish west coast. Uh, and for making the new nationals Swedish. How, you may ask? Well, the answer is priests. All over Scandinavia, uh, young peasant boys were sent to the university to be trained as priests. And then they were sent home to preach about uh, God and the king. Previously, boys from uh, Halland and Bohusland had been sent to Copenhagen, but now they were sent to Gothenburg instead. And then, after a couple of years, they were sent home to preach about uh, in Swedish and about Sweden and the Swedish king. Since the beginning, Gothenburg was a town and a fortress. The early fortifications were quite humble earthworks. But as Sweden became a more and more important player in Northern Europe, it was more important to make a good impression. So in the 1670s, a huge building project started. Gothenburg was supposed to get a proper and impressive defense. So for nearly 30 years, Gothenburg was a building site where soldiers, prisoners of war, and of course craftsmen were digging and building, giving Gothenburg huge walls. They were occupying about one fifth of the city's area. The city also got two stone towers, one on each side, and a small fortress on an island out in the fjord. Today, there's only one piece left of the wall, 
but it's very impressive. You can still visit the two stone towers and the fortress on the island. And if you put your hand on one of these rugged walls, you close your eyes, then maybe you could get an impression of what this city once may have looked like. So, this was the short version of the birth of Gothenburg, a story quite like the story of hundreds of other cities around the world, and quite unique. I hope you have enjoyed the journey and that you will enjoy your stay here in Gothenburg. Take the opportunity to learn all you can about this city, Sweden's gate to the west.